Welcome to Bushmanland in northeastern Namibia, some of the driest country south of the Sahara Desert. Pure heat and dust, this is an incredibly challenging environment. The people here rely on a good wet season to see them through the three months of dry. But recently, there's been little rain. The land is in drought. Well, it's the end of the dry season now, and the temperatures, well, they're touching 50 degrees. But out of sheer necessity, there is one people that have learned to make this their home, the Bushmen. The Johansi Bushmen, one of Africa's last tribes of hunter-gatherers, have lived here for more than 40,000 years. Their survival skills are extraordinary. Under the apartheid system, they lost much of their hunting land, which was crucial. In these harsh conditions, an area of bush the size of Kent can only feed 100 people. Yet generations of Johansi have survived in this hot, dry landscape where edible plants and animals are scarce for most of the year. I'm here to learn their traditional secrets of survival. The Johansi have had a turbulent history. During apartheid in the 1960s, the government created a town called Sumkwe in the middle of the Johansi land and encouraged the Bushmen to move in. They were offered a school, a store, modern medicine and welfare payments. By the 1970s, most of the Johansi lived here with permanent houses and for the first time ever, fresh running tap water. But despite this convenience, there was trouble. The Bushmen, bored and frustrated, were turning to alcohol, and Sumkwe became a dangerous and depressed town. In the move to a modern world, they had lost their culture and their roots. So they moved back, taking cattle they were given to supplement their traditional life and their age-old skills of hunting and gathering. I drove 400 kilometers into the wilderness to meet the Johansi people and discover their skills for myself. Laura is a large village in Bushman terms with nearly 70 mouths to feed. A tall order in a month when the temperature rises to 55 degrees and life is only bearable in the shade of the leadwood trees. The government provides some food to supplement their farming and there is a borehole for water. But to feed the village, they must still hunt and gather from the bush, an exhausting and dangerous business. Generations of hunting knowledge have been condensed into one single survival kit that each of the men carries. It contains all of his essential tools. This is my axe that I use when I go out hunting for chopping meat and gathering honey. These are fire sticks for the hand drill. They're made of marula wood. It's really light, quite delicate. This is my knife that I use for eating meat. I pull it out like this. A knife is the most important survival tool. With that, you can find everything you need for life. Nicely, it's in a really strong sheath for safety. This is my bow that I use for shooting either kudu or remspok.
That's the quiver where I keep my arrows in for hunting. You've seen my bow. Well, you can see this quiver is really hard and it's capped. And the reason for that is in here. You have to be very careful here. These are the famous Bushman arrows. And each one is covered in a poison most deadly. When you make an arrow for somebody else, it means that the first animal they catch with it belongs to you and you get all the meat. Then they can use the arrow again to catch more meat for themselves. To transform this small, slender arrow into a deadly weapon, an extraordinary natural poison is needed. The tribesmen have to make an exhausting journey deep into the wilderness to harvest the poison. They're looking for this bush, Comiflora africana. To untrained eyes, it has no distinguishing features, but the hunters know that hidden below it lies a deadly secret. Earlier in the year, the leaf beetle laid its eggs on the leaves of this bush. Having eaten their fill, the larvae fell off and buried themselves deep into the dry earth. The hunters must find these small, hard-shelled pupae before they grow into beetles. This shell has kept the grub from dehydrating. It's the soft, fleshy body inside that carries the poison. So lethal is this grub that once applied, the arrowhead needs only to pierce the skin for death to be a certainty. The arrows have now become something like flying hypodermic needles. Shot at close range with fatal consequences, the hunter will allow the animal to escape, certain in the knowledge that it will eventually die. All he has to do is track it to where it finally falls. While the arrows dry, the children are kept at a safe distance. There is no known antidote. Music brings welcome relief in this difficult land. Singing especially seems to lift their spirits. Which is just as well. The drought has made hunting so difficult, there's been no meat in the village for months. Corn millet can occasionally be bought from the store in Sumque. But with money in very short supply, the women must still rely on their traditional gathering skills. And besides, bush food is tastier. Choosing the right area to find enough food is only one of the problems. Actually getting there is another. The parched ground is crawling with hidden danger. Black mambas, scorpions and spiders whose bite will never heal are a constant presence. So they've developed an extraordinary ability to scan the ground while they walk, looking through the grass rather than at it, alert to the slightest movement. In these extreme temperatures, they walk in silence, fearful that if they were to laugh or sing, the sun would hear them, and thinking they like the heat would obligingly make it hotter. Even so, to survive these temperatures, they must find a source of water quickly. 
This seed pod is camouflaged and difficult to find, but the women know that its roots grow in the form of a tuber, which can hold sufficient water for a drink. Everyone must sit down, believing that if the tuber hears their footsteps, it will dig itself deeper. One woman only will begin to dig in the concrete-like ground, the others saving energy until they know there are tubers here. Hidden in this grass are the fallen seeds of the marula tree. They're similar to walnuts, but the heat has dried the kernel, so although there are plenty about, they're not very nutritious. In fact, they're often eaten as a snack instead of carrying them all the way home. <laughs> In October, it's the towering baobab tree that offers an abundance of tasty, nutritious fruit. It isn't difficult to find either. Known as the upside down tree because the branches resemble roots, it can be seen dominating the landscape throughout Bushmanland. Everything from birds to elephants feast on these fruit, so the women must gather all they can. The skin is tough and woody. Inside is a tasty but bone-dry citrusy flesh, which can be eaten raw or made into a mush for children. The people of Laura have access to a modern health clinic some 40 kilometers away. But if you have general problems with your eyes and a bit of neck ache like this woman, it's quicker to use the services of the village doctor. The traditional approach to most ailments is to grind up the charcoal of a local tree root and introduce it directly into the bloodstream. It's believed to heal just about anything. starts early. In this drought over the past few months, it's been rare to see game, let alone catch anything. So the more time you give yourself, the better. The dusty conditions here aren't all bad. Every morning you can look at the ground and read it like a newspaper, and there are written the movements of the animals from the previous night. But of course, these guys are reading at university level. To even begin to understand what they're seeing, you have to have a few fundamentals in the art of tracking. OK, you now have the sun behind you. I'll make a print. But from where you are, it's very difficult to see any of the shape or form of that track. But if you come around to my point of view, you'll see how the shadows really help. Here's something from the book of tracking that's well worth knowing. Tracks that are overall round in shape, with four toes, no claws, and a rear pad that has three distinct lobes are members of the cat family. And that is one big pussycat. That large rear lobe shows that it's a lion. And of course, knowing that they're a lion about 
helps to keep the Bushman off the lion's menu. You'll rarely see a Bushman run. Sweating heavily in this heat would mean having to drink almost continuously throughout the day. And for what little water can be found, there's fierce competition. One of the problems with finding water in a land as arid as this is that you've got to compete with all the other animals. Those elephants over there need up to 100 litres a day each to survive here. So they're drinking with attitude. If I was to go over there now to try and get some, I'd have a mighty big problem. Getting enough water on a hunt is a matter of life or death, as heat exhaustion can be fast and fatal. The hunters have to ensure a clean water supply, so every 15 kilometers or so, they choose a tree that can be easily memorized. Underneath, they half bury a container, traditionally a hollowed out ostrich egg which they have filled with water. <laughs> the stopper is made from grass and is enough to prevent any other thirsty creatures from helping themselves. These water breaks are a chance to get out of the burning sun and into the shade. It's a welcome relief to break the hunting silence. Goodness me, is there any left? <laughs> Water break over, the hunt returns to its steady but relentless pace. In these difficult months, they're hungry for meat. The hunters have spotted a kudu in the bushes just through there. Now they haven't had much luck hunting in the last three months, so I'm going to stay well out of their way. The guys have got an arrow into the kudu and now they've got to follow it until the poison does its work and the animal dies. But that's not as easy as you may think. Here there are easy tracks, one, two, three, and then they seem to disappear. It's these fine disturbances, pieces of grass pushed down, bits of sand turned over. That's where the art of tracking lies. The secret is being able to follow those. And that could take anything from a few hours to four days depending on the size of the beast. But the hunters must find it before they lose it to other opportunist predators, such as lions or jackals.
The depth of the arrow shows that the kudu has actually helped the hunters by rubbing itself against trees in an attempt to release it, in reality forcing the poison deeper. To get the meat away from other hungry carnivores, the Zhuhansi are masters at quickly butchering the animal into pieces that are easily carried home. They'll not risk traveling through the bush at night, so they've time to hang the meat to dry, making it appreciably lighter. It's getting towards nightfall. The hunters will sleep rough tonight, but empowered spiritually by feasting on the kudu's liver. Cooking will neutralize the arrow poison. They savor this meat. While hunting is always difficult in the dry season, it has been virtually impossible in the drought. In the village, they're well used to hunters returning empty-handed. So when food is scarce or the spirits low, the people gather together to perform a trance dance. Encouraged by the singing and intense rhythmic dancing, the shaman enters a trance state to cleanse the people of all their ills and renew their hope. But despite their best efforts, the Bushmen's way of life is under threat. The drought has been a problem, but now the land is at risk from neighboring tribes, tourists, and diamond prospectors, all trying to move in. But the Bushmen are great survivors. If they can hold on to their land, they have the skills to help them live. Their culture could survive.